you. Let's turn to Matthew 5. Let's turn to Matthew 5. I want to read the Beatitudes we've already ran through, and then we're going to stop at verse 7, which is the one that we're meditating on today. So when you're there, just say amen. Let's read what the Lord has been saying so far. So from verse 1 down to 7, this is what it says. Seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. And the verse that which we'll be focusing on today, Matthew 7, 5, 7. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. I want to read that just one more time to sink into our hearts. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Father, because your word is a lampstand. It is what illuminates all that which is truth, Father. Father, help us to not only be hearers of your word, but train us, Father, to be doers of your word. Father, forgive us, Lord, when we just read the pages of our Bible, but do not actually take it into our hearts, into our souls, into our bones, God. God, transform the way that which we see the world around us through your word. Help us to obey it. Help us to abide in it, Father. Not only when we're gathered here, God, but even when we're alone, when no one is around, when no voice is able to be heard, help us to run to your word, to your voice. Teach us to be merciful, Father. Speak through me. And in Jesus' name, amen. Before we could even dive into the reflections that I have prepared for you, I want to first define the actual term mercy. So mercy, it's a, it's a very, very common term. If you watch uh, a lot of TV surrounded by courtrooms and cops and criminal justice, you'll notice the pleading of mercy as a constant theme of so many scenarios where justice is required. To give you some perspective of the word mercy used here, it is the Greek word elios, and it's defined as pity and compassion. So there's synonyms surrounding this word, such as compassion and loving kindness and favor and steadfast love. And, and just to give you a biblical definition of this term mercy, when, when God's talking about this term, there's various definitions, but for the one we're using today, this is the definition for it. The biblical definition of mercy is the gift of God's undeserved kindness and compassion. The gift of undeserved kindness and compassion. Many of you know that in this particular season right now, many are awaiting for the holidays and seeking to enjoy uh, New Year's and Christmas. And with that comes all these different traditions and practices and festivities. And so one of the things that me and my wife decided to do the other day, we decided to decorate our whole home, Christmas theme. So if you ever walk inside, you'll see it looks like a winter wonderland. And, uh, and inside we're there, we're listening to all this music. And one thing I told my wife, I said, hey, look, we live in Miami. We don't get that much snow. We don't get anything. We don't even get snow. <laughs> Forget that. Um, I'm like, it's so hard to get into that holiday spirit. So I said, here's what we're going to do. Every single night, I want us to watch one Christmas movie. Just one Christmas movie, Right. And, uh, and so this week, we, we started watching a film. It's a very, very classic film. And uh, it's also a traditional novel known as A Christmas Carol. Has anyone here ever seen A Christmas Carol or read the book A Christmas Carol by Charles Dickens? Just raise your hand. Okay, we got some, uh, some book nerds here. That's awesome. Okay. So to, to give you some perspective about A Christmas Carol, A Christmas Carol is a story about a man named Scrooge. Okay? Scrooge is this grumpy man. Uh, he's uh, completely obsessed with money. And he lives his whole life devoted to his finances and his business. He created this business that uh, he acquainted with his close friend named Marley. And Marley and Scrooge, they run this business together. Uh, well, Marley passes away. He dies. 
And Scrooge continues on in this business as an old man, bitter and selfish and consumed by uh, his desires for riches. One of the things that starts to happen in the middle of the story is that he is confronted by the ghost of Christmas past. And only the ghost of Christmas past, but of the present and future. And in one of these scenarios, Charles Dickens speaks of how Scrooge was confronted by his friend Marley. Now, many of you may or may not know, but the whole story was actually inspired by the biblical parable of Lazarus and the rich man. So if you watch the movie, read the parable, you'll notice a lot of parallels. Charles Dickens did the story inspired by that. But in this particular moment, Scrooge is confronted by his friend Marley. And Marley is dead. And when Scrooge sees him, he's frightened. He's frightened by what's happened to his friend. And when he sees his friend, he notices he has all these chains wrapped around him. And he says that he can't rest in peace. He can't. There is no peace for him in the other life because of the way that which he lived. And in this moment, Scrooge looks at him and he tells him, but Marley, you were a businessman and you occupied yourselves with the things that which men value like money and wealth. Please just have mercy on me. Show compassion towards me and my life. And Marley looks at him and says, how can I give compassion to the life that you live when you live just like me? I lived my life with you in this business and I had no peace, says Marley. And there's this quote that he says to him and it really stuck out to me. He says, what was my business, Scrooge, was this. Mankind was my business. The common welfare was my business. Charity, mercy, forbearance, benevolence were all of my business. The dealings of my trade were but a drop of water in the comprehensive ocean of my business. And what Marley is trying to tell his friend Scrooge is, can't you see? We wasted our lives not caring for people. We wasted our lives caring more about ourselves and our own lives and our own temporal possessions that we didn't even realize the whole meaning of life was actually about caring for the well-being of other people, showing compassion and pity and mercy to them. And Scrooge is frightened by this. And so they show him all these different scenarios surrounding his life. My friends, I, I, I use that story just as an illustration for the Christian's life. That if it becomes the final moments of our lives and God himself confronted us, what would God say of your life? Was it concerned about the dealings of other people? Was it concerned about giving mercy to your neighbor? Or was it occupied on only living for the desires of your own selfish comforts and hearts? Jesus teaches us in this passage, blessed are the merciful because they shall receive mercy. But in order to be merciful would mean that you actually have to practice mercy towards others. So Jesus is teaching, be merciful to all those around you so that God himself be merciful with you. And when I look at a story like that, that many of us will remember and maybe we heard in, in our childhood, like a Christmas carol, I think what Marley was trying to tell Scrooge was, if only we focused on the mercies that mattered most. If only we gave our attention to that which mattered most, which was our fellow man and not ourselves. My friends, remember that in this life, how we live and treat others is a necessity to always meditate on, especially when one day you and I will be approaching the throne of Jesus Christ. He says, the greatest command is this, to love him with all of your hearts, yes, but to also love your neighbors. And many times, many Christians believe that the greatest virtue for the Christian is solely to know more about God, love God, be aware of his attributes, be aware of his truths, be aware of his wonders, have a preconceived understanding of the depths of theology and doctrine and all these wonderful things, and yet, many of us will lack love for our neighbor. And when you read a passage like this, it's the inescapable reality that Christians are called to be merciful. Because Christians are in the business of loving their neighbor. Christians are choosing to live a life not focused on themselves, but on those around them. So, for the merciful, here are the reflections for you. Three reflections, three meditations for those choosing to live a life of mercy. Number one. 
for those living this way, do not forget the merciful ministry of Jesus Christ. Do not forget the merciful ministry of Jesus Christ. Number two, do not forget the mercy given to you. Do not forget the mercy given to you. And last but not least, do not abstain mercy from others. Do not abstain mercy from others. Let's begin with the first meditation today. Do not forget the merciful ministry of Jesus Christ. Now, you may look at that and go, Pastor, we're Christians. Of course, we're never going to forget the merciful ministry of Christ. But the reason why I wanted to speak about his ministry is because he had an earthly ministry. And his ministry didn't just begin and end with his death on the cross and his resurrection. Jesus lived a complete life, and many times that life is overlooked by our fear of death. More people today are concerned about having the golden ticket to go to paradise than they are about actually knowing the Savior, Jesus. So my question for you today, do you know Jesus? Do you actually know the character of Christ? Not just that you know he is deity. Not just that you understand that God sent him to the world on a mission to atone for our sins and pardon us of our ruin. Amen. Do you know of his personality? Do you understand the work of Christ? The heart of Christ, the sentiments of Christ, and the way that which he himself treated people. And many times, we don't have a knowledge or an understanding of this. Too many pulpits preach many things about Christ and yet forget one of the most important components to his life. His actual life. And not just his death. The life that which he lived, where he dwelt among us, walked with us, served us, and gave every single ounce to give hope and redemption to any sinner in need of him. You see, the compassion of Christ was the light that illuminated joy and peace to all the souls he encountered. Let me tell you about this Jesus. When he entered into a room, he brought joy with him. Let me tell you about this Jesus. When Jesus entered any place, there was light surrounding him. Darkness cannot overcome him like the Apostle John says in the Gospel of John. This Jesus, if you just saw him and heard him speak, and you truly humbled yourself, you would never want to leave. I want to be right here. I don't want to go anywhere. I want him to keep talking. I want to just be next to him. I just want to glance at him. I just want to sit with him. What is it about this Jesus that every time he stares at me, I see the tenderness of his love? What is it about this Jesus that as he notices my weakness and my sorrow, he draws nearer to wipe away my tears? That was our Jesus. Our Jesus, while he was a man like us, was nothing actually like us in nature. He was God in the flesh. You see, Jesus walked towards the sick. Jesus embraced the poor. Jesus confronted the wicked. And for him, it was an opportunity to share with them an experience that which would give glory to God by showing the actual goodness of God. You see, so many people today say, I want to believe in God. And the sad thing is, yes, I'm glad if, if somehow in some way you came to that conclusion. But you know what I'm most concerned about? Not if whether or not you believe that he exists. But do you see how good he is when you know that he's real? Do you actually know that he's good? Have you actually tasted the goodness of God? Have you seen the comforting peace that only God can bring, that no man can provide for you? Many people today say many things about God without actually experiencing this level of union with him. Jesus was the one who would sit among sinners, and he would give the sinners a showcasing of compassion for them, only if they themselves would be willing to humble themselves and be honest about their desire to find truth. Young person, if you're seeking for truth, know that it is always and only found in Christ. If you are seeking for peace, know that it is only found in the Prince of Peace. Nevertheless, look at the Prince of Peace and ask yourself, was he merciful? Ask yourselves, how did he treat others? He would not turn away from any humble vessel, but rather he himself would only rebuke those who would exalt themselves. Jesus never looked down on anyone, but he would be the first to exhort anyone who thought highly of themselves. 
Here's my fear as a pastor. Sometimes in the church, we think higher of ourselves than our own brothers and sisters. And sometimes, the very people who want to help us, we look at with anger, contentment, and resentment, and still with the same lips say, I follow Jesus. Sure about that? You think Jesus would treat the person the way that you're treating them? You think Jesus would, would be as angry as you have been with them? Not forgiving them? Not loving them? Not reconciling with them? Or would Jesus seek to reconcile all things, being merciful? If you have your Bibles with you, I want us to turn to Matthew chapter 9. Glance at this particular passage with me. Matthew chapter 9, and let us read verses 9 through 13. And when you're there, just say amen. This is what the passage says. As Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, he told him. And Matthew got up and followed him. While Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. For I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. The religious men stare at this Jesus of Nazareth and notice how can it be that he's not dwelling in the temple with us, but rather he's dwelling in the house of a tax collector who steals from us. How can it be that he's sitting with Matthew who once robbed from us and served the Romans? How can it be that there are sinners around him and they actually want to be with him? The Bible doesn't even tell us what sins they were committing. And I think it's for the sake of protecting their own lives. Who knows how filthy, how wicked, and how lost those sinners were by Christ. But they were there. And he was there, sitting with them. And the Pharisees, thinking so highly of themselves, look at Jesus, who claims to be the Son of God, who says that he's God in the flesh, who says that he's the light of the world. Why is the light of the world sitting around darkness? What's he doing? He shouldn't be here. You ever met people like that as a Christian? They look at you, look at your friendship with people who are still in the world, and all you want for your friends in the world is to know Christ. And they look at you and say, why are you friends with them? I want them to know Christ. Why are you sitting with them? Because who else would sit with them? You want me to close my door to them, reject them, deny them, run away from them. I'm not scared of them. They need God the same way you do. And if someone didn't sit with us, would we know him? So look at Christ. He sat with them and they questioned him. And there you see it on verse 12. It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. And then you go to 13. He says, I desire mercy, not sacrifice, for I have come to call the right." Not to come to call the righteous, but sinners. And I love that part so much. Because Jesus is totally dissing everyone there. (laughs) Because Romans 3 says no one is righteous. So who in the world is Jesus talking to? He's saying, I've come for those who understand that they're not righteous. All of us. (laughs) No one's righteous. I've come for them who understand their need of me. I've come for them who know they've sinned against the holy God. I've come for them who know that they need forgiveness, the gospel, reconciliation, grace. But if you claim to be righteous, then you have no need for a Savior, and you definitely have no need for me, Jesus would say. And I love that because I'm going to be honest with you, especially as a just living this generation, you know, we're living with so much things attacking our, our culture and Western society and all these ideologies, especially with postmodernism and all these different things. And a lot of times, in the midst of haughty people who claim to be so righteous, we waste so much time trying to persuade them to know the gospel. And I read this text, and Jesus didn't waste a second with anyone who thought that they were righteous. 
You think you're perfect? All right, man, on with you with God. Anyways, I'm going to keep going for those who know that they're not. You think you got it all figured out? All right, man, well, I hope you find yourself with Christ, but I'm not going to feed pearls to pigs. I'm not wasting my time here. Until you humble yourself, you'll never understand the words I'm telling you. But for those who are willing to humble themselves and to listen to God's voice, this is to whom Christ went to. And Christ says that he came for them to have mercy. You see, we see the ministry of Christ. And one thing we notice about this ministry is that he's God in the midst of all things. Which also puts this crazy reality into play. That he has the authority to condemn any single person in his sight. No one else can condemn but he alone. Because he's God alone. And yet, he doesn't choose condemnation. He chooses redemption. It is Christ alone who can glance at the souls before him and say, I never knew you. Only he can do that. You can't do that. He can. It is Christ alone with the authority given to him that he could look at a man on the day of judgment and say, you denied me before man. Well, I'm going to deny you before the Father. Only Christ can do that. And yet, it is Christ alone with all of this authority that which he has that though he can use it to condemn mankind, notice in his ministry he does all that he can to redeem mankind. In fact, he says, my desire is not to condemn, but to redeem. Look at his heart as he lavishes redemption to those sinners around him in his life. Redemption is the faithful friend who believes you were made for more. Redemption is the water that washes the dirt from our past and presses us forward. Redemption is the second chance given to those who know they did not deserve the first. Christ gave redemption to all who placed their faith in him. For all who believed in his finished work at the cross. We get redemption, though we don't deserve it. That's his ministry. That's his life. And yet we hesitate to give such a blessing to those around us. If you have your Bibles with you, let's go to Ephesians chapter 1. In Ephesians 1 verse 7, Paul tells us this of God and redemption. Chapter, chapter 1 verse 7 says, In Him, in Jesus, in Him we have redemption through His blood. The forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight. So where does redemption come from? Through the blood of the lamb. And the lamb lived a perfect life and yet was willing to lay it down for those willing to be saved who could trust in him. This was his ministry. Just a couple examples if you read the Gospels. I ask you, did Jesus choose to stone the prostitute that the Pharisees wanted to stone? He did not. Did Jesus deny the thief who wanted to be remembered at the cross? He did not. Did Jesus walk away from Legion, who was filled with many demons in that cemetery, naked and alone? He did not. Did Jesus deny Nicodemus an opportunity to know what it means to be born again? He did not. Did Jesus turn away from Peter after Peter denied him three times? He did not. Did Jesus, as you just read, turn away from Matthew, though he was a tax collector? He did not. And he did not do so with many others because Christ desired mercy for them all. Consider this reality, that though Christ was the author of life, he tasted death on our behalf. I mean, that's compassion. That's pity that you and I do not deserve. That as the author of life, Jesus, though he was life himself, became a man like us. And in his earthly life, he became the emblem of mercy. Jesus Christ is the breastplate of compassion because he's the only one who went and died for people not worthy to be died for. This is our Lord. So if you seek to live a merciful life, Here's the most important requisite of it all. Study Jesus and ask yourself. Truly make the assessment. Are you living like that? 
do men see you like they saw Christ? Which leads to our second reflection. Do not forget the mercy given to you. Do not forget it. I believe one of the greatest errors in our Christian walk is that we forget things. And many times it's because we choose to. That's how evil we actually are. Like, like, for example, one of the scariest things that happens to us, and it will happen to you, and this is very frightening, I pray it doesn't, is that there will come a season in your life where the cross will grow cold to you. There will come a season in your life where a man can come and preach you the gospel and tell you of the glorious work of Christ and how he died on the cross for you, and yet you will look at that and go, I've heard it before, it means nothing to me. Because your sin means so much more in that moment than Christ. And all it takes is a couple of lessons that God will provide through his sovereignty to humble you again and realize, how can it be that I thought there was anything apart from the cross? You see, the truth is this. The the greater the Christian, the more humbled he is, and the weaker he is, and the more he remains in this place. And that place is this refuge to the Christian. The cross. You don't grow up out of that. You don't just go on to other glories and things in Scripture. Everything in Scripture points you back to the cross. Because at the cross, you're reminded of a mercy that you do not deserve. At the cross, you're reminded of God's goodness and the depths of His love. That somehow, in some way, He went and died for us. And who are we? We are wretched sinners. You're not just a sinner. You're a wretched sinner. I want to make that very clear. It's not just enough that you made some mistakes. I don't want to take this lightly. I believe one of the greatest issues today we face as Christians is we don't take sin seriously. We don't. We take many other things seriously but sin. We will take a church service's start time more serious than sin. We will take more serious what translations we're reading out of than sin. Some of us care more of conferences than sin. We care more of who's the next false teacher on the internet than sin. Think about this. What are you devoting your time to if not sanctification and being holy? If I am Satan, your enemy, I want you to forget the weight of your sin. Treat it lightly. And abuse of the grace given to you. Of course he's going to forgive you. Just keep sinning. Don't worry about it. Everything's going to be all right. Keep sinning. Remember, he he died once and for all. He just keeps sinning. And then all it takes is a moment for God to humble you. And then you're reminded why Solomon said it himself. The beginning of all wisdom is the fear of the Lord. Where is the fear of God? The reason we don't take sin seriously is because we don't fear God enough. And the reason why we keep playing with sin is because we think we can get away with it. I don't care who you are. I don't care what you've done. I want you to know something. God will hunt you down, and God will humble you. Regardless of what you show me, regardless of what you show people in this room, regardless of what anyone thinks about you, understand this. God sees you. God, the creator, the judge sees you. And he sees how little you take seriously his words. And he also sees you who take his words so seriously. For you in this room who prays and loves him with all your heart, don't ever think he's abandoned you. He sees that. See, many times in these positions as a preacher, we're focused on those failing. And we don't focus on applauding those who are actually doing the right thing. So I want to just give that time to them. You're reading the Bible? I applaud you, brother and sister. You're praying every day? I applaud you, brother and sister. You love him? You put everything secondary to him? Man, more power to you. God is good. May the Lord bless you. May he sustain you and hold you, Christian. Because that's what we were created for. You love worshiping him in spirit and in truth with all joy in your soul? That brings me joy. And, And God wants you to feel that peace and that joy when you're with him. So if you are doing these things, man, amen. Amen and amen. And maybe you think you're the only one. You're not. And and just know, for every Christian in this room, we're striving for the same thing. No one here is perfect. But I will say this. There's something so beautiful about this God 
that he gives us this mercy. Do not forget that he's given it towards you. And in those moments when you feel like you're all alone, like, I don't even know if anyone's there for me. Remember, your creator is there for you. Remember that your God is there for you, that he's with you. It's like, um, I, I think it was Paul Washer. I don't know which preacher at this point. But uh, there, was a, there was a quote, and it was, um, God notices all things, even the little tiny flower hidden in the depths of a forest. God notices when it blooms for his glory. So maybe you feel like a little flower, and all these other things are a lot bigger and a lot louder, and maybe you feel ignored, like God doesn't notice you. But if you're following him and you're faithful to him with the little you're stewarding, I want you to know it's not in vain. God sees the efforts you take for his glory. And one day living for the king is better than a thousand days living in iniquity and wickedness. So follow him, not only tonight, but every day of your life. We are wretched sinners. Romans chapter 7, verse 24 and 25, Paul says it. O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. And Paul speaks in that particular passage about this waging war against himself and the flesh. And one thing he just yells out loud is, who can save me? I rebel against him day and night and I can't stand it. The things I want to do I don't do and the things I don't do I end up doing. Go read it for yourself. It's a really beautiful passage, and it comforts so many Christians when we fight. But I love that part where he says, I'm dead. I'm weak. I need a Savior. Oh, praise be to Jesus Christ. He's that Savior. Praise be to God that he himself provides mercy for me when I do not deserve it. I mean, guys, think about this. When was the last time you sinned? Just think about that. When was the last time you sinned real, real hard and you know you sinned? And yet, how can it be you're breathing right now? You're alive? You're okay? You had food today? Wow, look at God's mercy. He gave you food. He let you breathe. He's blinking. You're hearing me? That's awesome. That's God. That's his mercy. Go read the Bible. Go read the Old Testament. See what happened every time someone took one of his commands lightly. People would drop dead. And who's to say that we can't now? We can. Guys, I've heard stories of people dying in the midst of preaching. And people can't explain why. They're just dead. They just died. I mean, so, so you just think about it. What makes you so sure that you're not going to die driving home tonight? You don't have that assurance. But here's what you do have the assurance of knowing. is that God's mercies are new every day. And here's what you do need to know about this God. Because for as wretched as you are, he comes not to condemn, but to redeem. And he actually desires to make all things new. But for those who understand the things that I'm saying, don't forget that part of being a Christian. Don't forget it. Don't forget that you don't deserve it. Don't forget that he saved you. Don't forget that he showed compassion towards you. Because the day you forget it will be the day that you will treat people terribly. I really do believe that. Because you'll forget about the one who saved you. Therefore, you'll forget about those before you. And the only person you'll be thinking about is yourself. That's what happened with the Pharisees. They thought more of themselves than they did think about the people around them. You see, as sinners, we desire to rebel against God. I quickly forget the truths of God because of this flesh. I quickly ignore the wonders of his goodness. And I quickly forget the depths of his grace. And many times I forget the saving work of the cross, which grieves my spirit day and night. I want to quote a song from one of my favorite rappers, uh, Shylin. For those of you who don't know, he's a reformed preacher. He's really awesome. And uh, he said this in the song. It's called, Were You There? And I, and I think this describes many of us when we forget the truths of God. He says this. I'm not going to wrap it. I'm just going to read it. He goes, We see disciples sleep and mock today with a lot to say. But we do the same thing when we don't watch and pray. You see, like Judas, we sell Christ out to get the treasure. 
whether it's the cheddar or or forbidden pleasure. Like the chief priests, we want Christ to surrender, but we want him out the way when he doesn't fit our agenda. Like Peter, we have misplaced fleshly confidence, but we'll deny the Lord when faced with deadly consequence. Like Herod, we're curious about Christ because he's famous, but we quickly get bored with him if he doesn't entertain us. Like Pilate, we see Christ and find nothing wrong with him, but when the world chooses the wicked, we go right along with them. Despite his kindness, we seek to do our maker violence, the fallenness of humanity at its finest. So now Jesus, he stands before the crowd, doomed to die. An angry mob is yelling out, crucify. The way they treat the Lord of glory is debased and it's foul. But you miss the point if you don't see your face in the crowd. And Shailen talks about this whole song, how we are those people who are forgetting the mercies of God. And many times we'll justify our haughtiness without realizing there is no righteousness that is of our own. We must remember that we do not deserve the cross and we do not deserve Christ. Do not forget the mercy given to you, Christian. Revel in it, ravish in it, lavish in it, stay within it and delight in it and love those around you. You see, I believe that when we actually remember mercy, and place it at the forefront of our hearts, that is where we actually value our salvation the most. So the goodness of salvation, yes, the reward is eternal life with the Lord. But I value it in the flesh knowing I never deserved it. That's how I value it. Because it's so good that it makes no sense that it's mine. It's so grand, it's so holy, it makes no sense that he would give it to me. Why would you die for me, Lord? Why would you take my sins away, knowing you didn't commit one of them, Father? And why would you desire eternal life with me? Why would you even want to spend eternal life with me when I can't five minutes with you in this earth? If that's what you want from me, Lord, how can it be? You're so merciful, Father. Mercy allows you to value the salvation given to you that you do not deserve. Let us turn to 1 Corinthians 15. Look at what Paul says of his own salvation. 1 Corinthians 15, and I want to look at verse 7 through 11. And this is what Paul says. Then Jesus, he appeared to James, and then to all the apostles. Verse 8. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace towards me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we preach and so you believe. Don't forget the grace that God has given you. Paul himself was not ashamed to write these words. He wrote it and he says, by the grace of God, I am what I am. I used to persecute the church. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. This is my testimony. Don't be ashamed of your testimony. Don't be ashamed of the dark places God pulled you out of because little do you realize that testimony will draw more to God. I don't know about you, but I'm crazy for testimonies. I mean, there are times I just for leisure will just search up testimonies online. There's something so beautiful when you read of like ex-gang members, ex-convicts, ex-prostitutes, divorced marriages. Uh, You read these broken scenarios that the world looks at and goes, I got no solution for you. And they go, but this Jesus, he saved me. And he brought me something that no one else could have ever given me. Mercy, forgiveness, compassion. That's all I needed in my life, and it changed everything. And that is what the gospel does. And with that, we lead into our final meditation tonight. 
Do not abstain mercy from others. You saw his ministry. You saw the way he carried himself. We made the meditation to realize how we are not worthy of the mercy in and of itself. And the last thing we're to be reminded of, that if we have now received this mercy, God is calling us not to abstain it from others. In fact, Jesus makes it clear in the text of Matthew 5, verse 7. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. You want mercy from God? I want mercy from God. Then be merciful. You want God to abstain his judgment against you? Learn to do the same for your neighbor. You want God to forgive you? Okay, learn to forgive people. You want God to love you? Learn to love people people because the truth is all have sinned and all may sin i wrote that very it's very important to understand all have sinned but all may sin and and this is important okay understand this i want you to think of those most righteous person you can think of apart from christ whoever that person is just imagine it take your time close your eyes do whatever you got to do if you got that person they may sin tomorrow will you still be merciful Because a lot of times we have this false image of our mind about men. And we make idols out of men. You think Charles Spurgeon didn't sin? You think Calvin didn't sin? You think Leonard Ravenhill didn't sin? You think Vody Bauckham didn't sin? You think Paul Washer didn't sin? You think John MacArthur hasn't sinned? John Piper hasn't sinned? Whoever you thought of that was righteous, I just want you to understand something. I hope you're merciful towards them. Because a lot of times we prop up people in a way that God says to never do so. There's only one we prop up knowing we don't need to even extend mercy to, and it's Christ. Because he's the only one who is righteous. Why do I say that? Because when your heroes fall, will you still give them mercy? When those who you love, when your leaders fall in any capacity, will you still have grace and mercy for them? When the people who you once worshipped side by side, saw them every day, evangelized with, love on God with, do all these great things with, and they fail you, will you still give them mercy? And oh, how twisted and selfish are we that we turn at those most close and say, you of all people, why? You were closest to me, and you offend me, you hurt me. I can't give you mercy. A lot of times it's those nearest to us that we can't extend mercy to. It actually becomes harder to give mercy to them who are nearest to us because our expectations for them are so high. And here's what I want you to know. The Bible says stop setting those expectations because they're just people. The same way you're just a person. So I, I don't come here preaching to anyone. And please don't misinterpret what I'm saying. I don't come here preaching these things to you presuming that all of you are perfect, righteous saints of God who are in glorified bodies already. That's not at all what I perceive of any of you. I see you as people striving to endure this grand work of salvation, just like me, till we see him face to face. That's what I see you as. And some of you will have weeks where it's five steps forward, ten steps back, ten steps forward, three steps back. But here's what I do know. When the Holy Spirit enters your life and indwells within you, He will carry you to the end. It's not going to be your effort or your feet or how much steps you did anything. It's him taking you because God will finish the good work that which he has started. Charles Spurgeon said this. There is an exceeding melody to my ear as well as to my heart in that word tender and mercy. Mercy is music and tender mercy is the most exquisite form of it especially to a broken heart. To the one who is despondent and despairing, this word is life from the dead. A great sinner, much bruised by the lashes of conscience, will bend his ear this way and cry. Let me hear again the dulcet sound of these words, tender mercy. If you think of this tenderness in connection with God, it will strike you with wonder for an instant that one so great should be so tender and merciful towards us. Spurgeon says to those in the darkest of places, the word mercy is like a lifeboat saving them from the depths of drowning. 
And maybe you haven't been in that position, but I know what that position looks like. You ever been in that position where you're the problem? You ever been in that position where you hurt people? You ever been in that position where you realize you're actually not the good guy in this story? You're actually the one that inflicted pain? You know what's the hardest part about being in that place? Is that you feel like no one should even give you mercy. Because you look at yourself and go, I'm a mess. And then there's something always so beautiful. And just one friend, even if it's just one friend, comes by and says, hey, I still love you, man. Hey, I still love you, sis. I'm still here with you. You failed, but you're my friend. And I care for you. And you're my brother in Christ. And we're going to get through this. And we're going to pray. And all it takes is that one friend to say, I'm going to give you mercy and compassion. I mean, guys, put yourselves in the shoes. I always think of this person, the prostitute, that was going to be stoned. Let's just try our best to reflect on this illustration. Imagine if you were this prostitute. According to Scripture, she was caught in the middle of the act. She may have been naked. And they grab her. A bunch of men grabbed her against her will. Strangling, moving, who knows? They grab her and they throw her to the ground and present her before Jesus. And Jesus doesn't even look at her, and many scholars say it's because she was probably naked. He's drawing on the ground. They say, is she not worthy to be stoned, Lord? Is that not what the law of Moses says? That's exactly what it says. But here's my question for you all, he says to them. You without sin cast the first stone. And all the Pharisees holding the stones realize, oh, snap, we're just as dirty as her. We're just as sinful as her, and we're going to stone her? I mean, if I'm going to be honest about this, if the Pharisees were thinking this, and I doubt they were, but if we're going to be honest about this, we may be stoned as well with her because no one is righteous. And then Jesus walks up to her. Remember that part of the story? Oh, I love that part. And he looks at her and he says, daughter, Do you see anyone accusing you? She says, no one. And he says, neither do I. Oh, man. Imagine being that woman. You don't know her story. She was a daughter like all the many women here. Who knows what she lived through? And she became a prostitute, selling her body for money. And this Jesus is holding her hands, probably looking at her. Imagine looking at those eyes. And he says, does anyone accuse you? There's no one, neither do I. Go and sin no more. I mean, that's mercy. Are we that way? Are we merciful? Because there may be a day, Christian, that you may end up just like her, and the crowds and the mobs may surround you, and wouldn't you do anything to have someone like Jesus nearby and say, I'm going to give you mercy. Not because actions don't have consequences. Not because exhortation isn't required. Not because sin shouldn't be taken seriously. But because the gospel is greater than sin itself. Because forgiveness is the emblem of the Christian faith. This is why Jesus teaches us. If you have your Bibles, just two more passages. Matthew chapter 7. Jesus teaches this to his followers. Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 through 6. Judge not that you be not judged. For with the judgment you pronounced, you will be judged. And with the measure you use it, it will be measured to you. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, when there is the log in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly and take the speck out of your brother's eye. Do not give dogs what is holy, and do not throw your pearls before pigs, lest they trample them underfoot and turn to attack you. So Jesus goes, hey, look, correction is great. Just be careful about the judgment you're having about people, because it's going to be judged right back at you. Remember that famous thing in elementary school? One finger you point, three fingers are pointed back at you. The same way you're going to measure people's lives, just know that God's going to measure your life as well. So you're mad because someone didn't pray today, read today. God looking at you going, did you read or pray today? You're mad because, 
I don't know. I don't know why you could be mad, but the God's looking right back at you, hoping you're following faithfully to his word. So be careful of the way you look at the people around you. They're people, and they will fall short. Consider this last passage as a warning. Matthew chapter 23. Follow Jesus, who unifies and forgives and gives mercy, but do not follow Satan, who seeks to divide, accuse, and destroy. Look at Matthew 23, and I just want to read this as our last passage of reading tonight, and then we'll worship. But as we read this, for those of you with your Bibles, I want you to look at each verse and think about mercy, and then ask yourselves, did the Pharisees live a life of mercy? And if they didn't, and I, and I don't think they did, listen to what Jesus says about the way they treated the people around them. Okay, it says this. Then Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, The scribes and the Pharisees, they sit on Moses' seat. So do and observe whatever they tell you, but not the works they do. For they preach, but do not practice. They tie up heavy burdens, hard to bear, and then they lay them on people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to move them with their fingers. They do all their deeds to be seen by others, for they make their phylacteries broad and their fringes long. That's a long word. Verse 6. Phylacteries. Thank you, brother. And they love the place of honor at feasts and the best seats in the synagogues, and greetings in the marketplaces, and being called rabbi by others. But you are not to be called rabbi, for you have one teacher, and you are all brothers. And call no man your father on earth, for you have one father who is in heaven. Neither be called instructors, for you have one instructor, the Christ. The greatest among you shall be your servant." And whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. But woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you shut the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. For you neither enter yourselves, nor allow those who would enter to go in. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you travel across sea and land to make a single proselyte. And when he becomes a proselyte, you make him twice as much a child of hell as yourselves. Do those people sound merciful to you? I would say absolutely not, which is why Jesus is so angry at them. He goes, listen to what they say, but don't ever do what they do. Because they're preaching from the Bible, and you know that's inspired by the Spirit. And you know what they do, these Pharisees? They just burden people. They tell them all these things they ought to be doing, but they don't do it themselves, and they don't lift a finger while it, whether it's demanded of them. They go and they claim to evangelize, but what are they actually evangelizing if all the people are going to become is just like them, children of hell? They give no mercy to anyone. They actually break people's backs and burden them with things that no one can accomplish. They're fools. They're not the instructors you want in your life. I have one instructor, and it's Jesus. And Jesus forgave sinners, and he gave mercy, and he taught, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. I don't care what sin you've committed in your life. I want you to be forgiven, and I want you to know God. I don't look at you less. And I don't look at you more. I look at you like someone like me in need of knowing their creator who died for him on the cross and who loves them. I show no partiality to any man. I can't. And if I do, then I've sinned. All of us are equal and all of us are in need of tasting the goodness of the gospel. And all of us are in need of mercy. So pray that we may be merciful. I'm going to ask the worship team to come up and everyone else, can we stand? Can we pray? Let's pray to God, and, uh, and, let's, and let's pray that God would make us more merciful. Let's bow our heads. Father, we thank you for this night. We thank you for the words that which you have revealed to us. Help us to not be hearers of the word, but doers of your word. Help us, Father, to show compassion, even to those who we know are not worthy of it. Father, who is worthy of it? We have all sinned against you. Teach us, Father. Be our teacher. Teach us to give love. 
pity and mercy for those near to us. Remind us of the compassion you've given us, Father, and help us to love people the way you love us. Be with your church. Teach us, Father. And in Jesus' name, amen.